Last Sunday we had a discussion period and the topic was violence. Someone had asked that there be a discussion on that topic. We also added another two suggestions, how to listen to news and politics, thinking this may, there may be a relationship But as discussion periods go, nothing was really looked at in great depth, at least for that time being. Many topics are brought up even though they're related, some of them more than others. We usually don't listen very much to each other. We're anxious to bring up our question, pursue it to a degree, and just wait till there's an opening, to, till someone has finished or almost finished talking. So what has just been brought up isn't heard or isn't gone into because a new question is brought up, and so it goes. Maybe in the course of months or years, if we stick with it, we will listen more and really address ourselves to something that has just been brought up, instead of immediately going on to something else and something else and something else. always skimming along the surface, like these little water insects, whose legs that skim the surface are reflected in the water. People react differently to the question periods. Some people say, I'm not going to go to those anymore. Some people feel a real sense of frustration at the skipping around or not really going into usually one's own question. Some people tell me that even though there was great frustration during the, the question period, something has not let go of them and keeps bugging during the day or the succeeding days. And usually, or sometimes, not usually, sometimes leading to real insight into one's own ways of acting and thinking, something that has been stirred up during such a frustrating period. Some people bring it to meeting, yes, to, to really... Uh, go in depth into something that was not dealt with properly in the question period, and you're all free to do that. We'll go to any length or depth on a single topic, because that's the beauty of it. One single topic gone into all the way may reveal the whole thing. of violence or fear, and if one is at the bottom of fear, it reveals the whole thing, one has also revealed violence. Also, and some people have mentioned that, that they have become aware of this during the period, this skipping around, this fragmentation that goes on during a discussion period really reveals to an interested observer, his or her own mind. It's not just the other people who are doing that. This is how the mind functions. Our mind is revealed in this. This incredibly short attention span and then something else. 
something isn't quite clear, becomes difficult to look at or think about or dangerous or uncomfortable, so one jumps to something else which is more pleasant. The self-assertiveness that is in it or its opposite. So this is also how, how one can look at and listen to these question periods as revealing the human mind in its usually more superficial aspect. Coming back to the topic of violence, maybe to start from a completely different direction. Any time that a human being has been deeply concerned, passionately interested in finding out something about something, whether it is the stars, the close ones or the distant ones, the galaxies, or this planet, the solar system. This earth or the creatures on this earth, animals of all sizes, plants, all the weather, how things function and work, forces, gravity, electricity, the atom, the particles, the nucleus, or sickness, disease, or oneself. Any time that a human being has been urgently and passionately interested in finding out something, there is revealed to oneself, to the investigator, the indisputable interrelatedness of everything. no matter where one starts, from the very smallest to the very largest, one finds that everything is interrelated, affecting each other minutely or heavily. The scientist conducts a controlled experiment. The reason that the variables are controlled is we know that everything affects everything. Even the light with which one observes through a microscope, that light affects what is being observed. Not just I see that and I'm very objective. The light by which I see affects the seeing, and what is seen. And in this universe of interrelatedness, of which we are an integral part, just as everything else is an integral part, constantly moving, changing, evolving, in this interrelated, interconnected, interdependent whole, a human being says and thinks and feels and argues, I am separate.
a human being also wonders what is this I that feels so separate and says I'm separate. It is nothing, nothing to be taken for granted. Saying I am separate and not just saying it but feeling it, having already been molded in that feeling by our parents who feel the same way, parents feel the same way all over, so children do. Feeling the separate I, which if one begins to examine it, may turn out to be nothing but ideas, memories, images, thoughts of the past projected into the future and yet leading to this solid feeling of me as somebody separate. This feeling leads to fear. It is unavoidably linked wedded to fear. Fear of separation, fear of the isolation, the vulnerability of isolation. And it is wedded to, to desire to feel secure in this isolation, which is an impossible task right from the very beginning. The isolated fears its isolation, desires protection in its isolation, but it is an impossible task from the very outset. Because isolation is isolation, and it is thought created. It is not real. So the feeling of isolation, separation, being me as contrasted to everything that's not me, you, they, seeks protection in many ways, in infinite ways. asking others to join me or joining others to feel protection in, in group, group support, other support. looking for security through power. The more power I have over others, the more secure my life will be because these others are working for me, are working under me, and therefore no potential enemy, no, no enemies, no danger from others if I have power over them, if I control them. Of course, there's insecurity in that because the thing may reverse. It's never really guaranteed. Security is sought in pleasures, but they don't last. They can't be secured, albeit for a certain time. But it's always the, the insecurity of something coming to an end, 
in the need for more protection or defense or pleasure. Another way of making this me work, the self-isolation in me work, is having others get out of my way so that my way can prevail. Which is the exercise of power or persuasion. Just trying to get my way from early childhood on, trying to get one's way. To, to affirm that I am someone who others respect, others give way to, and the image is reaffirmed, is secured for a while until something goes wrong, until somebody else wants me to get out of their way, and then there's a clash. All of this, as, as you're following it, looking into it, you see all of this, looking for power, for pleasure, for others to get out of one's way, holds for everyone. So chaos of clashing interests, power trips, pleasure trips, is is quite understandable. It, it, it follows. This my way, the way of myself, what is it? You, you may not be convinced that there isn't such a thing as my uh, unique way, my personality, because I'm, I'm obviously different from you and you and you. So what is this my way? It is the way in which I have been brought up in my particular family, but my particular family did not grow up in a, in a vacuum, it grew up in a neighborhood in a certain social economic class, certain country, certain continent at a certain time in history, certain climate, food. All of this affecting how I grew up. And all of this affecting human beings wherever they grow up. There may be differences in these things that have been mentioned, different class, different education, different religion, so, uh, culture, North Pole or the equator or the moderate zones, all of it affecting human beings a little bit differently. But human beings are affected by the culture, the education, the religion, they're molded. And my way, which I think is uniquely individual, is the way in which I've been molded by all of these influences, including what I've read and the heroes I aspire to emulate, to follow, to become like, which that holds true for each human being. All my reactions against my culture, all my parents, my religion, which is also not unique. The reaction is not free from what is reacted against. It's dominated by that, just driven by that into the other extreme. Not free from it. Or all the little or large revenges that I've stored up, the hurts that have been stored up in the mind and needing to to come out. It's an interesting thing which everybody can observe. How once hurt or slighted or prevented in a hurtful way from doing something that, 
that experience which is kept in the mental books wants out, wants to, to repeat itself and wants to complete itself. So does years and years and years and there's all this potential clash, which is violence. times when a talk is given you may feel, I've heard that so many times, beware of this comment, may be true, it is true, but the moment this occurs, one may immediately switch, well one actually is in memory at that moment, there is no direct listening, there is memory operating and comparing and judging and impossible to really look again anew, afresh, at what is happening in oneself. So to put aside the notion that something is repetitive and therefore get out of repetitiveness oneself, that area in the brain which functions repetitively, namely the memory, and to look at self, at me, at isolation, at whatever is being talked about freshly, trying to really discern it with an attention that is free from comparison or judgment, free from judgment, free from time. It was like this yesterday, how long will I continue like that? That prevents listening now. Does one see from the way one lives that the moment the me takes over my way with a driving force to assert itself or to protect itself or to become something better, more powerful, more righteous, more spiritual, There's the whole groundwork for violence. Violence with oneself and with others who get in the way. Whether this is in a trite kind of family argument, in the business, at the office, at work, it doesn't matter as long as there's this enclosure, this encapsulation in my way. The system is geared to defend or push violently, to, to bring it off. And the, the system, the body, will furnish the energy for that. Because the, the feeling of I and mine, my point of view, my ways, generates energy. The energy to protect, to push through, to defend, and to attack, all of this energy is there since our animal days. Because animal behavior is also coded into the primitive part of our brain. Protection of me and mine. In the animal it's the family, the territory, the females, against intrusion. And the energy is immediately triggered to do that, to carry it through for survival. <laughs> And yet the survival of the me is just the continuation of this whole 
misery and aggression and defense and fear of loss or losing. Fear of dying. This came out at the very end of the last question period. Whether or not all violence is closely linked with a fear of one's own death. Trying to violently survive. Where one has to really look into this whole thing. What, is, what am I afraid of when I say I'm afraid of my death? Is it just the death of the physical body? You can, you can do that. Of course we can. If we need to find out, then we just question that to over and over again. Is this just fearing the death of the physical body, or is there a fearing of not continuing as I know myself and as I want to continue? As me, my ways, my works, my possessions, relationships. And not to say this is wrong, I'm not saying this is wrong, but it must be seen. Or else the fear is just an irrational force in our life, which it is. Never allowing to really come up into the air, into the light. So it is with violence. Word violence already evokes the association of its being bad, <coughs> evil, and those words have associations in the mind and therefore a tremendous resistance to facing violence in oneself, to even acknowledging that there may be a possibility of that is very difficult for someone who has been raised to only think of himself or herself in positive images. That's it, and they division right through, as it were, the middle of oneself. There's positiveness and everything negatively must not exist, must be denied, not looked at, shoved below something or other, below consciousness, and therefore then very vividly detected in other people, where it's all right to see it, not only all right, but it gives one relief from the pressure inside. To see aggression in other people and to fight it there <laughs> or to condemn it there with a self-image of righteousness. I may paint a very starkly a gross picture, but Can it help to discover what takes place in oneself? When one gossips about other people's faults, gossiping meaning here just sort of indulging in pointing a, a subtle finger at it or not so subtle finger at it and feeling superior to that, which is violence in itself. The violence of not allowing what is within oneself to, to be acknowledged, seen, felt, listened to as a whole. Without any point of view or rationalization.
The word violence may evoke thoughts about the violence in the streets. murder, rape, fighting, the wars that are going on flaring up in this country, that country, never knows where the next one will flare up. Somebody asked in the last question period, what if we had not fought Hitler? What would have happened to us, or what would have happened? The answer to that is, I don't know. I don't know. We can't possibly answer that question. Speculative. But you can look around. Read the newspaper, listen to the news. Violence is with us in no diminished degree. Torture is with us. Wars. Armament. First two atomic bombs dropped after Hitler was already dead or near dead. So where have we gotten with all our wars? We're preparing for new ones. Of course, we say we're preparing for defense, but defense and attack are synonymous. So this is so the prototypes in our mind of violence is armed conflict, people hurting each other. And yet there's so much subtle violence that goes on in everyone's life, even though one is, has never been to war, will never hold a gun, never punch somebody down. Actually, we hinted at gossip. There can be real violence in, in gossip about other people, sort of demolishing someone, someone's reputation or through talking about him or her with things that may or may not be so, one never really quite knows, one never can know, one isn't that person and what all went on, what all the circumstances where that led to something that one heard, hears very fragmentarily about. In all the competitive action that we're involved in, that we're encouraged to be involved in, starting before school, there's so much violence for both the winner and the loser. Any image one has of oneself, whether as a winner or a loser, does violence to the totality of oneself, which cannot possibly be captured in an image, which is free-flowing and free to change unless a violent image or an image is violently imposed upon, upon this free potential to, to see, to change, to, to have insight. whether this image is of me or of you, if I have this iron cast image of what you are because I've been through this with you so many times and now I really know you. It's violent. I'm doing violence to you. Because you may approach me completely fresh. Some, something may have happened, some insight. You've seen something and here you come and I see you as how you came yesterday. There's already a 
there's already a, a wall there, at least from my side, if I have this image of you, which stunts another person. And very often, unless in, in a human being there's freedom from image, and not just freedom, but the understanding of image making in oneself and others. If that freedom is there, one can see what the other person does and, and respond freely, not act according to this image which is violently imposed upon one. One sees this is the process that's happening in this person. <coughs> maybe it can be pointed to, maybe not. Maybe the circumstances are not favorable for that. The person would just get offensive. But if this understanding, this profound understanding of, of, of image-making and the effect of the image on, on oneself and others, if this is not there, the understanding, then how another person thinks of me really affects me very strongly. I live up to this image of how he or she sees me or wants me to be, because this is how I've been brought up. for my security of being loved, protected, or at least not hassled. So does one get a glimpse into the violence of, of imposing images upon my oneself and others, and then thinking this is the real me and this is you? as I've known you for years. And then the immediate question, can there be freedom from these straight suits, straight jackets and armors? So that two human beings can relate totally without violence. And totally without violence usually brings in its wake something entirely new, which is love that is not sentimentality or, again, conditioned, learned, accepted behavior, but a free-flowing reaching out or embracing of everything and everyone without any image any expectation, no hardness or rigidity, defense or attack. Because when there is no sense of me, what is there to make secure? Can you imagine or see? That's much better. And when there's no sense of me, there's no need for security to make this me secure. What an incredible relief. You may not climb to the top of your company. But you don't have to defend and attack and live in violence. So in the violent energy to assert something or defend something or cut somebody down who has been so totally ununderstanding of one's situation and the, the annoyance, the, the unfairness of it, all of that arouses the energy 
to attack or to defend. And it, it floods, it, it permeates the whole system. There's no part, not the tip of the ears, which are left out. At what point can that be seen? Can that be, can that come into awareness? And by awareness it's not meant, oh my God, I'm getting so violent, how terrible. I must control this. I must pull myself together because I don't want to be a violent person. <laughs> that's not attention. That's conditioned response. Early conditioned, anciently conditioned, or recently conditioned doesn't make any difference. Is there a, a totally different way of being with an upsurging of violence? Anger, hate, jealousy, all of this is violence. If you ask this question and really need to find out, not find out ways of controlling or suppressing, but find out what this is, how it manifests itself, then the attention is there. Because the whole question doesn't come out of a program to attack or suppress, but out of an unprogrammed interest and concern. With, with the human mind, the human being, who is an integral, integral part of this whole universe. And as it bleeps and functions and thrashes about, <coughs> the effect is there. It's there, it's everywhere, because we're all hanged together. Most felt with the person you live closest to, but that person lives close to someone else and works with someone, and that person does. So like a stone dropped into a lake, the ripples just spread oh. infinitely and are also felt above and below. There's no moralizing in this. It could this these words could fall into an ancient groove of you should do this, you must not be that, or we, or I. It's, it has nothing to do with that. Needing to find out is one's, is, is one's own affair. No one can dictate it and no one can do it. can only happen here, come out of question and inquiry. Let me read you, um, if I may, a section with a few deletions from a newsletter which came from the Minnesota Zen Meditation Center, winter 83. The whole, the whole piece is called Rape 1, 2, and 3. It's written by a woman who was raped. And in diff at different periods of time she wrote these three pieces of poetic prose about the experience. 
and we'll read rape number two. He pushed me into the car from behind. I was screaming. I sat in the middle of a man and boy. Surrounded, they kept pushing my head down so my chin touched my chest. Don't you look at me, don't you look at me or I'll kill you. Over and over his mantra. They pulled at my rings. I took off my diamond wedding ring and gave it to them. It was raining out and it was afternoon. But instead I was under the full moon sitting zazen in the country, as I was just two nights before. I thought in a flash of a second this story. Ryokan, a Zen master, lived in the simplest kind of life, in a little hut at the foot of a mountain. One evening a thief visited the hut, only to discover there was nothing in it to steal. Ryokan returned and caught him. You may have come a long way to visit me, he told the prowler, and you should not return empty-handed. Please, take my clothes as a gift. The thief was bewildered. <laughs> He took the clothes and slunk away. Ryokan sat naked, watching the moon. Poor fellow, he mused, I wish I could give him this beautiful moon. To go towards the enemy, no resistance. To go towards and merge with the object, and therefore to lose the subject. These things I had contemplated fully the week before at Sashin, at catching the Moon Mountain Monastery. In the middle of this horrible commotion, still calm from Sashin, I try to go towards my enemy, even in rape. To the ordinary mind, this is heresy. This is the guilt. This is the guilt that I didn't defend myself. But who is there to defend? Only to become fully the situation, a woman amidst a violent crime, where passively and compliance, where passivity and compliance gets her out alive. I try to stay in the center now, to realize the impermanence of the horrific situation, one breath after the next breath, through the tunnel of this trap, until I was out. So I couldn't see what direction he left in. He made me kiss the front seat, I knew it was over my heart pounding. To go towards my victim, my oppressor as victim, I felt so deeply his suffering. To go towards my oppressor's suffering, to become suffering, to be simply in the action of the crime without judgment, I came out alive. Now, two weeks later, there are many supposed twos of hate. I do not have the ordinary world's reaction I think of and understand for the first time this story. Nansen cuts the cat in two. Nansen saw the monks of the eastern and western halls fighting over a cat. He sees the cat and told the monks, if any of you say a good word, you can save the cat. No one answered, so Nansen boldly cut the cat in two pieces. That evening, Joshua returned and Nansen told him about this. 
Joshua removed his sandals and placing them both on his head walked out. Nansen said, If you had been there, you could have saved the cat. <coughs> In the commentary, had Joshua been there, he would have enforced the edict oppositely. Joshua snatches the sword and Nansen, Nansen begs for his life. I did not know then that this violator would turn the world around, that the rapist would set my mind free, or that my anger would kill him pounding and stabbing my empty couch at midnight. Everything is in reverse. I see in one of Frida Kahlo's paintings that the roots of a tree are coming out of a skeleton buried in its soil. Death fertilizing life. As this rape nourishes my understanding and suffering teaches our souls. But this is so upside down to ordinary mind. How dare I say in ordinary mind the rape is a gift. And yet I understand something. I'd been saying all winter that the structure of my ego building had finally collapsed and it was laying in ruin and rubble in the floor of my pelvis. Head, shoulders, rib cage, spine collapsed in a pile. And now I say zap, like a vacuum cleaner, the rape sucking all the debris out and spinning it with great force into the universe, clean and empty inside. Where's the person who got raped? We will end here for today.